Today we'll, I guess, transition into speculation from multi-threading, although we have already transitioned, if you've noticed. How was the lecture on Monday? Was it interesting for you guys? Learning about a real system. It was still relatively high level but because there are so many things in that system, but hopefully you got a sense of uh, what kind of things go into a system. Uh, well, some of the things we'll talk about, like transactional memories in that system, right? Hopefully you read the paper, or you will read the paper on Thursday. OK, I guess let's get started. Uh, you had a paper due on multiscalar processors. I hope everyone did it. Was that interesting? That's, that's a seminal paper, so uh, everybody should read that carefully, and we'll cover that today. Uh, that, that paper, as I said, had a lot of influence on the research that happened in the, I guess, last 15 years or so, or 17 years or so. So a lot of people try to emulate the ideas, I think, that exist in that paper. How can we speculatively parallelize the program? There were papers before that, but this paper had a lot of impact because uh, they, they first laid out the architecture uh, for doing something like this. And we'll cover the upsides and downsides of the microarchitecture they proposed when we get to it. Hopefully you've figured out some of the downsides because downsides are always a place for improvement, right? So I'll ask you what, what, what the downsides are. Upsides are kind of obvious, right? If you can do this, it's great. And there are some good ideas in there in terms of speculative parallelization. Uh, and we, you have two other papers. Uh, do one we've already covered, the DIVA paper by Todd Austin, and the other is by Hurley and Moss on transactional memory. Basically, this is a proposal that's somewhat similar to what's implemented in System Z, I think, at least the, uh, the small transaction part of it. Okay? Okay, what did we do in the last lecture just to brush up uh, on your memory? We wrapped up multi-threading. Although you'll see that we haven't fully wrapped up multi-threading. We'll keep coming back to it. Uh, especially different uses of it we've discussed. Transient fault tolerance. Diva can be considered a kind if you, uh, if you stretch your mind a little bit, it could be considered a form of multi-threading, right? You have a different thread at the end doing the checking. <laughs> it's not really a thread, but uh, it's something that's doing the checking. Uh, we covered microarchitecture-based introspection very quickly, and we talked about helper threading. And then we had the Systems E guest lecture at the end. Uh, well, in the last, uh, in, uh, uh, this Monday. Today we'll do a little bit more multi-threading and uh, talk about speculation. Well, uh, let's see. You've seen the slide several times now. We've covered a lot of things here. Uh, we've used multi-threading for redundant execution, for helper threading for exception handling, but we didn't use it for implicit parallelization. So to, today we'll talk about how can you use the multi-threading hardware for implicit parallelization. Of course, the ideas we'll talk about are usually more general. It's really uh, not specific to multi-threading hardware. When you have multiple cores or multiple processing engines or multiple hardware contexts, how can you take a single threaded program and have it execute in parallel on these hardware contexts, which could be uh, just a part of multi-thread hardware, multi-core, even multi-processors, and get higher performance implicitly without programmer support. Okay. I think we've covered this. This is to, again, uh, give you an idea of what we have covered. Last thing we covered was uh, basically why do we have these users? Because we can communicate and synchronize with very low latency between the threads. And this will become especially important when we talk about implicit parallelization. If you want to fine-grain parallelize your program, that communication latency is very important. You want to detect the dependency violations between your threads very quickly. And you can think of the multi-scalar hardware in your head while, th uh, while thinking of this. Uh, and if your threads are much closer in hardware, which is enabled by multi-threading, you can do this much faster, right? If you have a lot of communication between threads, you can do this much faster. Even multi-core has higher latency to achieve this because you need to go through the cache hierarchy, right? Whereas with multi-threading, 
you can do this uh, on the, at the L1 cache level, right? Or maybe even at the register level, if you can implicitly parallelize your program, right? One, one thread can write to a register, another thread can read from that register. And multiscalar does this. Right? In multiscalar, you read the paper, so you know that the compiler specifies which registers are communicated between different threads or tasks, as they call them. And uh, the hardware forwards those registers that are to be communicated between tasks. And there's the register level communication. Okay. Okay. We talked about helper threading. The idea was to pre-execute a piece of the program solely for prefetching data, uh, at least for prefetching purposes. Uh, and this is again a speculative thread, right? You're speculatively executing this piece of the program to prefetch data. This may be useful or may not be useful. And all kinds of issues arise here. And this thread can be executed on a separate processor core, uh, processor, or separate hardware thread context, or on the same thread context in idle cycles. And I'm not going to go over those again, but you should be able to do those trade-offs very well right now. Uh, what is the benefit and what is the downside of executing it on a different core, on a different thread, or on the same thread context? Right. And these were the papers. You've already read one of them. There are three issues which we, uh, again, briefly covered, which you should be comfortable with, I think, in terms of uh, the related trade-offs. Where do you execute the pre-computation thread? I briefly covered that just now even. When do you spawn the pre-computation thread? When do you start to fork this pre-computation thread? That's important. If you fork it too early, it may be, it may prefetch data that's never going to be used, right? Because you may never reach that load that you're trying to prefetch for because there are so many branches in between and your control flow path that does not get you to that load that's going to miss. If you're doing this for a branch, again, you may never reach that branch that you're pre-computing for. So you're wasting energy in that case. And also your, uh, your thread will be contending uh, with uh, your main thread. Your helper thread will be contending with main thread. If you spawn this uh, thread too late, then prefetch may not be timely. Right? You may be doing work that the program is doing anyway, and in the end, you're not going to get any benefit. You just increase your energy and contention. So it's important to figure out where to spawn this pre-computation thread. And this is a tough problem in general. Uh, I don't, I don't think there is a very good solution out there that has solved the problem. Uh, because you, you will need to adapt to dynamic conditions as well, right? If, uh, you, you'll need, you'll need somehow, somewhat of a feedback mechanism to do this in a good way. And I haven't seen any good solutions that have done, uh, done a good job in that feedback mechanism. Like where, where do we spawn this thread based on the feedback uh, that we're getting in terms of the benefits uh, and the downsides of get the current spawn point. And this could be an interesting research area, actually, because uh, if you can do this, well, first of all, uh, you, you need to show the problem, show that the problem exists. And I believe the problem exists because, especially with multi-core, this is a problem that many people have not examined, especially with multi-core, you will have resource contention. And uh, the fact that you added a fork point or a spawn point uh, in your program for a helper thread, uh, let's say at compile time, doesn't mean that that's the best point, right? Because you have resource contention, and because of that resource contention, now your best spawn point may change because your loads may get delayed, right? So this is a problem no one has examined as far as I know. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that this approach may not be easy to get benefits from when you have multi-core processors with resource contention. Uh, okay. When you, or another, yeah, when do you spawn the pre-computation thread? Another way is when the main thread is stalled. And Renate execution does this, right? Uh, there could be other, it doesn't have to be Renate execution, right? You could, when the main thread is stalled for a long latency uh, cache miss, you can fetch one of these pre-computation threads. But that may not be your best option. You, you, again, you need to make sure that the pre-computation thread you're fetching is going to be beneficial in the future at that particular point in time. So which pre-computation thread you fetch may be an interesting 
uh, question as well. So there are a lot of unresolved issues in thread-based pre-execution, even something like helper threading. Mm. You can implement these uh, features in today's systems and uh, there have been papers that we've discussed in 447. Do you guys remember that paper? No? I guess not. I'll, I'll give you the uh, author and the conference name so that you can find out. You can do. You can. It's look, CK look, ISCA 2001. I hope I got it right. But he examined uh, the effect of uh, pre execution based threads on a simultaneous multi threading processor. I've given you all the keywords for the title, I think. No, it's just a Google search. <laughs> if you put it on Google, it'll, it'll pop up. <laughs> it used to be that if you put it on Bing, it never popped up, but maybe they fixed that. <laughs> they, did they fix it? They did? Okay, good. <laughs> when I was there, <laughs> it never popped up, so everybody at Microsoft Research was using Google to search for papers. Okay, so you could do, you could do uh, this uh, in real systems, and that paper is one, of, one example uh, that showed that. Uh, okay, I guess I'll uh, skip uh, the details of this one. Then the question is when to terminate the pre-computation thread. If you, if you figure out that your pre-computation thread is not doing useful work anymore, uh, you can uh, insert cancel instructions uh, to figure, uh, to cancel the thread when, it, when your pre-computation thread is not doing good work, right? Uh, or it's not being useful anymore. And this paper, again, discusses when to insert, some cases to insert uh, that. You could also uh, terminate the pre-computation thread if you're resource constrained, right? If, you, if you're causing a lot of contention because of that thread. So there are a lot of, actually, there are a lot of research issues uh, related to all of these questions. And if you're interested, I would encourage you uh, to look into some of these issues, if you, especially in general, if you're interested in multi-threading in general. Because this is an area that's being ignored currently, as far as I know. <laughs> okay. A related uh, work is slipstream processors. I alluded to this uh, before. I did not assign this paper. Maybe I should have. I guess who wants this paper to be assigned also? Right, nobody. <laughs> I did not assign this paper, and I'll get to why I did not assign this paper. Uh, so the goal here is to, again, uh, use multiple thread contexts to speed up single thread execution. So this is very similar to uh, multiscaler. It's much later than multiscaler, but the approach is very different. Uh, we would like to implicitly parallelize the program. And the way slipstream processors does it is, you divide the program into two threads, not like multiscaler. Multiscaler can have n tasks, right? Uh, two separate threads. You have one advanced thread and a redundant thread. The advanced thread executes a reduced instruction stream. It's not the full program, and it does it speculatively. We'll get to how you uh, form this reduced instruction stream, but it basically skips some instructions. Redundant thread. Uh, uses the results that come from this reduced instruction stream and prefetches that come from this reduced instruction stream and branch predictions that are generated by this advanced thread. And that's why it executes relatively fast when those results are available. But it also executes the entire program to ensure correctness. So the purpose of the advanced thread is to go ahead fast and discover, if you will, what will happen in the program and feed those results, uh, cache misses, much earlier than it would otherwise happen if you had only a single thread. Feed those things uh, into the redundant thread, such that the redundant thread can execute correctly, but the redundant thread also executes everything so that the program executes correctly. Make sense? So you basically have two threads. So the benefit is execution time of the overall program hopefully reduces because the two threads together go much faster than a single thread. Right. Uh, and the core idea, as I said earlier, is similar to many thread-level speculation approaches. 
the difference between multiscalar and this, since you read the multiscalar paper, is here you have a reduced instruction stream, right? Multiscalar doesn't reduce the instruction stream. It just divides a single instruction stream into parallel tasks and executes them in parallel. Here there are only two streams, although you could imagine having more than two. Mm. One is reduced, one is full, and you parallelize the program that way. And this is uh, one of the papers. And they talk about how to improve fault tolerance also, and you can imagine how to do that, right? Now you're executing some instructions uh, redundantly, and you can check the results as well while you're improving performance. Make sense? Okay, so that's the high level idea. Why is it called slipstreaming? This is uh, copied from the paper. Apparently this is very common in NASCAR races. How many of you are NASCAR fans here? I assume this, this, a similar phenomenon happens in Formula One also. <laughs> but basically at speeds in excess of, I don't know how true this is, this is quoted from the paper, uh, maybe at lower speeds it also happens, maybe at, uh, basically you have higher pressure that forms in the front of a race car and partial vacuum that forms behind it. And this creates drag and limits the car's top speed. But now if you have a second car that's positioned itself behind the first, it fills the vacuum, right? And reduces the drag of the car. Which means that the, uh, the car in front can go faster and the car in the back can go faster because now uh, it's, it's, too, it's close to the front car. It doesn't have the wind resistance coming to the front. Both cars can go faster together. And drivers actually take advantage of this in those races. That's, that's why you see everybody ganging together instead of going separately from each other. Does that make sense? You guys may have uh, known of this phenomenon. <laughs> that's called slipstreaming, apparently, or drafting. Well, I guess uh, I, there must have been studies done on it, but uh, according to this paper, bo both cars speed up by several miles per hour. And several miles per hour could be very important, right, in a race like that. Of course, the downside is both cars can hit each other too, right? <laughs> which, which does happen too. Okay, uh, so that's the analogy. That's why it's called slipstream uh, processors. Now, the question is actually, what, how, do you, how do you ensure that that uh, vacuum is filled, the drag is reduced, right? If, if, you, wa if you want to continue the analogy, uh, the drag is reduced, uh, I guess that analogy breaks down here, right? <laughs> you somehow need to reduce the instruction stream in the first thread. The second thread, the analogy is okay because the first thread feeds results into the second thread, right? Redundant thread now can use results from the advanced thread, which is similar to uh, that uh, re wind resistance going away. Okay, so how do you, how do you uh, construct this advanced thread or A stream as the paper calls it, advanced stream? Basically, uh, there are many ways of doing it and you can think about this also. Uh, I actually, uh, one of the reasons this is not implemented in today's processors, in my opinion, is the paper's way of doing it is, is not a good way. But what they do is they try to detect and remove ineffectual instructions, and I'll get to that, what is ineffectual in their case. Uh, and they sh run a shortened effectual version of the program. Uh, the R stream, the redundant stream, ensures correctness by running a complete version of the program. And we already talked about that. Okay, shortened stream runs fast, and R stream consumes near perfect control and data flow outcomes from the A stream. Okay, we already talked about this. So let's, let's go into uh, how you reduce this uh, A stream, how you come up with a reduced A stream. Basically, uh, the proposal in this paper is you figure out those dynamic instructions that repeatedly and predictably have no observable effect. Basically, unreferenced writes, uh, non-modifying writes. Why could this happen? Because you may always be writing zero, right, to the same location. Unreferenced writes, why could this happen? This could happen because of compiler optimizations, right? You could have a branch, you could do a store, and you could have a branch, and you could never, uh, you may never uh, use that store uh, before modifying it uh, again. 
And the second is dynamic branches whose outcomes are consistently predicted correctly. So if you have a loop branch that, uh, where the loop executes a billion times, you can probably remove uh, that branch from the A stream as well as the data flow leading to that branch. Right. That's the idea. That's probably easier to do. But basically you can remove the, uh, in these instructions and the data flow leading into instructions leading into these instructions. That reduces the stream. Now you can imagine the complexity that goes into this, right? You have to detect these instructions first and you have to remove, uh, well detect the instructions that are feeding into these instructions but not feeding into other instructions. You have to do data flow analysis in hardware and remove these instructions. Make sense? It's a tough thing to do. That's one of the reasons this is uh, difficult to do. But there may be other ways, so that doesn't kill the idea yet. And how do you do this? Basically, this is the advanced stream. It's, uh, it has this instruction removal detector. And then you have an instruction removal predictor, which basically removes an instruction from A stream after repeated indications from the IR detector. So IR detector says, this instruction has been useless. Let's remove it. And if, that, if it has been consistent, this IR predictor removes that instruction. And you keep removing instructions. Uh, that's how you do the data flow analysis dynamically. Uh, okay. I guess you can uh, read the paper for details. Uh, but in the end, end result is the advanced stream skips these instructions that are deemed ineffectual and executes everything else and inserts them into this uh, delay buffer. And this is the buffer where our stream is going to pull instructions from. Mm. Oh. And our stream executes all instructions because remember it needs to maintain correctness but uses results from the delay buffer as predictions. So if an instruction executed, let's say add, uh, a multiply is probably a better example. A multiply instruction executed, you can just get its result and use it as a prediction, right? You still need to verify the inputs to the instruction so that, uh, because if the inputs are incorrect, inputs were incorrect when, it, when the instruction executed in the A stream, then your output would be incorrect, right? So there needs to be additional complexity to do this verification. Make sense? And that's why this uh, R stream can go faster because it uses these results as value predictions. It also uses the branch outcomes, at least for non-removed branches, as branch predictions, right? Of course, they share the memory system, so it uses the prefetch data from the L2 cache. Uh, uh, the data that's prefetched by A stream uh, is used by the R stream as, uh, to, to, to go faster. Okay, now you can, you can see some of the complexities associated with this, right? If you have mm, removed an instruction here, how do you synchronize the A stream and R stream state? Because you're not executing some of the branches here, so you need to, uh, you're skipping some of the branches. How does the R stream know that uh, the branch prediction that's made by the A stream corresponds to the branch that it's fetching? Once instructions are removed, that may be difficult to do, right? You need to tag the instructions somehow, or you need to tag the instructions that you removed somehow so that the R stream is synchronized. Okay? Okay. Uh, so what if A stream, the advanced stream, deviates from correct execution? Because it can, right? You removed some instructions, and that's a prediction. That may not be correct. You may have removed a branch that you think is always predicted correctly, but it may be mispredicted, and you cannot verify this because you're not executing that instruction in the A stream. So a redundant stream uh, detects this, and redundant stream detects this because a misprediction happens in the redundant stream, right? And once that uh, is detected, uh, the A stream register state needs to be restored. Redundant stream is always correct, right? It, it always has a correct architectural state. So architectural state gets copied from the redundant stream state 
uh, to the advanced stream state. What about the memory state? Well, uh, A streams L1 data cache, which is private, needs to be invalidated, right? Because it has stored some data there, which is not visible to anybody else, and was using that data to go ahead. And that needs to be invalidated now. This is basically speculative stores that happen in the L1 data cache. Make sense so far? If, you're, if you have questions about the details, you should read the paper. I don't guarantee that you'll get answers on the paper. <laughs> and that's part of the uh, problem with the paper. The, pro the paper is more of an idea paper. In the idea sense, it uh, delivers very well because it sounds like a great idea, right? But when you go into the implementation side, that's where the paper fails, in my opinion, because uh, this kind of implementation is very, very hard to do <laughs> in real life. But then we'll cover another paper right after this very soon, which has much higher chance of being implemented in real life because it removes the right instructions, in my opinion. This is, uh, so it's difficult to uh, do this kind of uh, removal. And if you read the paper, you will see uh, a lot of other issues that are related to this. But there may be other ways of removing things. Okay. So how to recover, you've covered also. So some questions. Uh, let's take the idea in the paper. How do you construct the advanced thread, and how do you speed up the redundant thread? These are the two key questions, I think, uh, in something like this. This is also called a leader-follower architecture. You have a leader thread, and you have a follower thread, and leader uh, makes both of them faster. So of course, leader needs to lead. <laughs> it needs to go adva uh, uh, advance fast enough, right? So original proposal does this. It dynamically eliminates redundant instructions, silent stores, and dynamically dead instructions. Silent stores meaning stores that keep storing the same value. First of all, there may not be a lot of them, although previous work reported that there are quite a few of them that may not necessarily be uh, correct in all applications. So again, sec uh, second of all, dynamically dead instructions may not be many. Right? Uh, it also proposes to dynamically eliminate ease to predict branches. But you can take the high-level idea and think about other ways of constructing the advanced thread, right? Uh, one of them could be perhaps you profile the program and the software constructs the thread. Right? That may be a lot easier to do, to remove instructions in software based on some profile information. At least it eliminates the hardware complexity. And as we will see, you can dynamically ignore long latency stalls. That could be one way of removing some instructions. If you get a cache miss, long latency cache miss, you just ignore, uh, well, you send the request, but you ignore those instructions that are dependent on the long latency cache miss. And that's one very easy way to get ahead. Right? Assuming these long latency stalls happen, of course. Uh, and there may be other ways, too. I'd encourage you to think about that. The second question is how do you speed up the redundant thread? The original proposal was to reuse instruction results. These are essentially control and data flow outcomes from the A stream, uh, advanced stream. Control is easy to do, but data flow outcomes may be harder to integrate into the pipeline, right? Especially if you're an out-of-order processor. Now your source needs to, somehow you need to figure out that your source is coming from that delay buffer. Right? And how do you figure that out? That may be difficult. You need to integrate it right at the, uh, at the right point. Right? But you're executing instructions out of order. Control is easier because you're fetching instructions in order, and the delay buffer hopefully is in order because it's the somewhat uh, committed, or uh, not committed to architectural state, but graduated instruction stream coming out of the advanced thread. Right? It's all in order. Whereas data flow outcomes need to be incorporated into an out of order engine. And it's not, it, that doesn't happen in order. So you need to have, it, have a way of basically searching this delay buffer, which complicates the uh, problem. Other ways, so, so a simpler way would be to perhaps use only the branch results and the prefetch data as predictions without incorporating the data outcomes. Make sense? Okay, you can think more. Uh, okay, so that was one example of leader follower architecture. Uh, architectures. Another example is dual core execution. And I think this is a more implementable uh, way of doing this. 
although no one has done it yet for perhaps other reasons. And hopefully you, you'll, uh, you'll come up with those reasons when I ask them soon. So the idea here is it's very similar, right? Uh, you have two cores, and they don't have to be cores. They can be threads, again, th thread contexts. Uh, basically, one thread context speculates it run a runs ahead on load misses and prefetches data for another thread context. Now, this, uh, in this case, they called it the back processor. The back processor, uh, oh wait, the front processor, sorry. I, I got turned around. <laughs> You can think of this front processor as the advanced stream, right? It's basically executing a shortened version of the program. And how is it getting ahead? How is it shortening the program? And when it gets a long latency cache miss, it basically does run ahead execution. It doesn't stop. And that way it gets, gets ahead. And it keeps executing instructions and feeding those instructions into this result queue. And this back processor basically executes every single instruction and ensures correctness. So this, uh, the, uh, the interesting part here is this always stays in the run ahead mode once it enters run ahead mode until there needs to be synchronization that happens between these two. And we'll get to that. So this way you can stay in run ahead mode for a long time. That's why you, you, uh, you can implicit, uh, implicitly parallelize the program, right? One thread stays in run ahead mode for a long time, and the other thread uh, basically ensures correctness. Does this remind you of one, uh, one processor that we discussed? No? Sounds similar to SunRock, right? SunRock had two, two threads, and when one of them got to uh, a long latency cache miss, it kept doing run ahead execution, and it had, maybe not exactly like this, it didn't have a result queue, but it, it had its own working register file, and it did communicate results to the, uh, I guess I, I, don't, I don't remember what they called it, the redundant thread, I'll call it right now, uh, because I've used that redundant thread term a lot right now. Uh, the, the redundant thread basically ensured correctness in a SunRock. So in a sense, the, an idea like this already uh, was almost implemented in a real processor. Right? Except the uh, 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 lower level details were different. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's go into a little bit more detail. So we have two processors. One is the front processor. This runs faster by invalidating long latency cache missing loads. Uh, it's basically the same as run ahead execution. Uh, you have load misses and their dependents invalidated, and branch miss predictions depend on cache misses cannot be resolved. Uh, and uh, you have accurate prefetches to warm up caches, hopefully, and you have hopefully correctly resolved independent branch miss predictions that are communicated to the back processor. Right. Back processor, the purpose of it is really to uh, ensure correctness uh, by re-execution of instructions, right. similar to the redundant thread again. And also, it executes instructions that were not executed in the front processor. Again, similar to slipstream. Uh, which means that it resolves mispredictions that are dependent on long latency cache misses. And if it finds out that that branch, well, in case of such a misprediction, you have a branch that's dependent on long latency cache miss, and if it finds out that it was mispredicted by this front processor, at that point, then it signals a branch miss prediction. Right? So you need to refetch from that point for the entire system. Uh, the benefits are similar. Back processor now makes faster progress with help from the front processor because you get a highly accurate instruction stream, hopefully, because some of the uh, branches are resolved here, and hopefully warmed up data caches because of run ahead execution. And these are the two benefits here. OK. These are slides uh, from Hu Yang Zhou. Uh, he graciously used uh, my animation and added more to it. <laughs> so I was pretty happy to see this. But I don't have the animated version. <laughs> Basically, this is the slide that you've seen before, except he added another miss to demonstrate the benefit of this approach. 
uh, basically what run ahead does is you, it, you can parallelize misses, right, that are independent. But what run ahead cannot do is if you have another independent miss, you're limited. Run ahead, is lim run ahead cannot get to that independent miss because once the first miss comes back, you flush the pipeline and start re-executing instructions. Right? With dual core execution, the front processor can always be in run ahead mode, assuming it's on the correct path. Because if it's on the incorrect path, this will be detected by the back processor, and then you will synchronize and you'll restart fetch. So the front processor is always in run ahead mode. When it gets a long latency cache miss, it gets into run ahead mode, it starts speculatively executing the instruction stream, and it generates these misses that are in parallel. Right? The back processor stalls for the long latency cache miss it encounters. It re-executes all instructions, so load one miss is executed here, and then it uh, gets invalidated, put into that result queue between the two processors, and after some point, the back processor fetches that load one miss, it re-executes it, and it finds out it's still a load miss. Right? It's, it's still a cache miss. Then it starts stalling. And it will stall until load one miss comes back. But the front processor can keep running ahead. Which means that when the back processor actually re-executes load two and load three, these misses have already been served. And now by using two processors, you've saved a lot of cycles. One processor remains in run ahead mode for a long time. Make sense? So this overcomes one limitation of run ahead execution, which is run ahead period is limited to how long your long latency cache miss is. You can think of it that way, or you can think of this as implicitly parallelizing the program by using two threads. And it happens to use run-ahead execution to get ahead in the advanced thread. Okay. And the microarchitecture changes are much less, uh, much smaller compared to slipstream. Right. Um, what are the microarchitecture changes? Basically, you need to be able to support run-ahead execution in the front processor. You need to be able to have this result queue. Uh, and the committed instructions from the front processor go into the result queue, and they get fetched uh, by the back processor. And note that every instruction uh, in the dynamic instruction stream, in the predicted dynamic instruction stream, goes into this result queue. Nothing gets dropped. In slipstream, there were a lot of instructions that get dropped. So now it's easier to synchronize between the two processors. And this marks us for the multi-program mode. So if you're actually ex executing a different thread, you should be fetching from the instruction cache, right? Not the result queue. Uh, and that's, uh, that's pretty much it. You, you also need uh, signals, like a global branch misprediction signal, uh, because if this uh, back processor executes a branch that was mispredicted and that was dependent on a long latency cache miss, it needs to signal misprediction to the front processor. And that misprediction, uh, now it's, you have a longer pipeline, if you will. Right. Okay, so the changes are relatively small. So you could think of this as, a, as building a large instruction window also. There's another way of looking at it. Right. You've started fetching instructions here, and uh, your oldest instruction is here. And you may have many, many instructions in the design. So building a large instruction window is difficult because if you have a single core, you need a monolithic instruction window. Right? Whereas if you have two cores that are decoupled with this result queue, you can have relatively small instruction windows in each of these cores, but you can have a huge result queue. Right? And that result queue is FIFO, first in, first out. So it's simple to build. You don't do, out of, you, you don't do reads from the middle of it. You don't do content associative search. You just, this processor uh, places uh, instructions that it finishes, in, uh, puts them into the tail, and the back processor removes instructions from the head of the queue. Which means that if, uh, if you get a, a long latency cache miss, for example, let's say 5,000 cycles, uh, you can actually have a large enough queue that buffers these instructions. Right? 
Now, you may not be executing all those instructions because this, while the instructions are in this queue, they've, they've, they've been either executed or invalidated in the front processor, and they're just waiting to be fetched from the back processor. But you can tolerate latency much better. In fact, the paper title is, if you realize that building a highly scalable single-thread instruction window. Okay? Okay. So I guess let's compare. There, there could be many comparison points, as you can see. You could compare dual-core execution to run-aid execution. And I think we've done that in 740, if you remember. Uh, you could compare dual-core execution to slipstream, which is, the, which is what I'm going to do here. You could compare dual-core dual execution to a large instruction window. And hopefully you're comfortable doing all of these. Like what is, the, what is the downside compared to a large instruction window of this, of dual-core execution? What benefit does a large instruction window provide you that this cannot provide you? That could be true, yeah. That could be true. That may be hard to evaluate, but you may be right because you're putting a full core. I'm thinking of the latency tolerance benefit, though. Like there, there's a lat latency tolerance benefit. La large instruction window provides you nicely. This cannot provide you. Basically, you can tolerate any latency with large instruction windows, right? It doesn't matter if it's a five cycle latency, 10 cycle latency, 100 cycle latency. Here, uh, you get the benefit of a large instruction window only, only when you have long latency cache misses. Right? Now, you could argue that you could do this for short latency operations also, but uh, the fact that those operations need to go through the result queue, wait for a while, and then need to be fetched and go through another pipeline uh, makes that a little bit uh, unattractive. Because if, you, if you're going to execute the instruction two, si two cycles later, why, why have it go through the result queue and go through another pipeline right, to get the result and supply it quickly to dependent instructions? So that's one benefit. Uh, you cannot get with, uh, with this, but you could get with a large instruction window. I'll encourage you to think more. But let's uh, compare dual core execution to slipstream. Uh, at the idea level, at the high level, they're very similar, right? These are actually exploiting two threads to parallelize a single program. Uh, and in fact, at, at some level, uh, dual core execution is also removing instructions, but not fully removing instructions. But it's not removing dead instructions, right? That's, that's one big difference at the implementation level. It's not trying to detect these dead instructions to remove. Uh, and that reduced a lot of complexity. It doesn't reuse instruction register results. Uh, and it uses the leading hardware context solely for prefetching and branch prediction purposes. As a result, it's easier to implement. It leads to smaller hardware cost and complexity compared to slipstream. Uh, but the downside is the leading thread cannot run ahead as much as in slipstream when there are no cache misses. Like imagine when there are no cache misses in your program. Slipstream can parallelize that program better, assuming that you could remove some instructions. Right? Whereas this, cannot, this doesn't give you any benefit. In fact, this loses performance. Right? Why? Because you have a longer pipeline now, right? Your pipeline is really composed of two processors. You could potentially dis, uh, think about disabling the back processor and running the front processor as a non-speculative processor when you don't have cache misses, of course. But that will still not improve the performance, uh, get the performance you, would, you could potentially get with slipstream. Anything else? I'm sure there are other trade-offs, but I gave you the two key high-level ones. 
Well, I guess there is one more. <laughs> yeah, if you don't reuse results in the trailing thread, you can again reduce the overall performance benefit. But this does come at a complexity, reusing the results. And dual core execution paper actually evaluates the benefit of reusing the results and they uh, find that it's not very high. Okay, some results, uh, actually they do have comparisons to slip streaming. Uh, these are, I guess, spec benchmarks. This is the average. Let's take a look at the average. Uh, this is normalized to uh, the baseline, I assume, which is a one core processor. And dual core execution basically uh, provides about a 30% uh, performance improvement. And the second part is value prediction, which is reusing the results as value predictions. And you can see there is a blip there. So it doesn't buy, buy that much in these cases. Uh, and this is the benefit you get from slipstreaming as, for, as, uh, as best as they could implement it. Because I can imagine the implementation of that would be a challenge. And the benefit is about 8% or so or 7% or so. Okay. Any questions? I guess you could do better than this, right? <laughs> so what are the downsides of du uh, dual core execution? Now you have two cores, right? You need to have two cores. This was evaluated on uh, a two core system. You could imagine doing this in an SMT processor also. Uh, and that starts becoming similar to uh, Sun Niagara now, simultaneous speculative threading, right? But the performance benefits may go down also in that case. Okay. Let's see if there is anything else. Uh, so I'd encourage you to read both papers. I did not assign them, but th this is, uh, these are interesting papers to read, especially if you're looking into doing research in multi-threading. Uh, there have been some other papers that I've looked at constructing the speculative thread uh, using software, and I think that's an interesting approach also. Mm. And you could now start specializing the cores for the ex uh, execution of these speculative threads and the redundant threads, right? So you could potentially think about reducing the cost of this dual core execution by specializing the cores. But none of that is, uh, has been done. Okay. I guess one other thing before I move to thread level speculation. If you uh, look at slipstreaming, uh, you will see no discussion of memory in slipstreaming, whereas dual core execution is all about memory. So it'd be good to keep that in mind. Ideally, I think, when you construct a speculative thread, you need to take into account both. Uh, you, do, uh, you need to take into account memory latency, which slipstream doesn't ignores pretty much. And in fact, I think the memory latency that's used in that work is about 20 cycles or so, which is which you would love to have, right? <laughs> 20 cycles to memory. <laughs> uh, but uh, as I said, if you don't have long latency cache misses, dual core execution doesn't work or doesn't buy you the benefits that it buys you. So somehow you need to find ways of uh, having, uh, advancing the advanced thread when you don't have memory uh, long, long latency cache misses. And Sunrock cannot do that either, right? because it does. It goes into this mode, uh, advanced mode, uh, when, it, when it actually gets a cache miss. Okay, uh, thread level speculation uh, is another uh, name for a lot of these approaches. Actually, uh, this is also called speculative multi-threading, dynamic multi-threading. Although dynamic multi-threading has uh, a name uh, to it, uh, has a uh, specific uh, mechanism associated with it too. Uh, but the idea is again uh, similar, except the, the, dip, the main difference in thread level speculation and uh, the slipstream like approaches or leader follower architectures is you don't reduce the instruction stream. But again, if you blink a little bit, these, these are all similar approaches in that they're trying to divide a single instruction stream speculatively into multiple threads at compile time or runtime. That's the most general way of looking at it. 
And when people talk about thread level speculation or speculative multi-threading, these speculative threads are executed in multiple hardware contexts and usually they're not reduced. Usually they're full part of the program. And their results are merged into a single stream and committed. Uh, so in this case, the difference uh, between, the main difference between slipstream-like approaches is uh, the threads are executing in parallel, which means that you need to check whether they conflict with each other. If that parallel execution violates any dependencies. I'll show you an example of this. Basically, I guess one way of drawing this is you can think of this instruction stream as a single instruction stream. You can chop it up into pieces and speculatively execute these pieces on four cores, let's say, since I chopped up into four. But you have no idea whether these pieces are dependent or independent. You're going to build in checks into hardware and software to see if any true dependencies are violated. So we still want to, uh, the programming model is still uh, a single instruction stream model, right? single thread. We want to preserve that illusion to the programmer. But we want to be able to parallelize pieces of this single thread and if we can do that without violating dependencies, now we can execute faster and we can retire these pieces in order. It's very similar to out-of-order execution, except that the granularity of these tasks, right, or chunks or threads. Does that make sense? With out-of-order execution, you, have, you do the same thing, except you do it at the instruction level. You can execute instructions within a single stream out of order and in parallel, perhaps. But you need to retire those instructions in order. Here, we're going to execute chunks or tasks within the same thread, potentially out of order or in parallel. But we're going to keep the illusion that they're a single thread, which means that we're going to retire these chunks in order or make the results visible to the programmer in order. Except this is at a higher level in the sense that each of these tasks can be executed on an out of order processor, right? The instructions within each task can be executed out of order. Make sense? So what do you need to do to ensure that? Well, you need to do similar things that you do in out of order execution, which, needs to, which means that you need to check the sequential semantics is maintained. Uh, you don't violate any true dependencies. Now it turns out to be this is uh, a little bit more difficult. Uh, you can, so what you can do is you can assume that threads are independent or you can use value prediction to break dependencies between threads right? or branch prediction. And Multiscalar did uh, branch prediction. It did not use value prediction. But you need to somehow execute the entire code correctly to verify the predictions that you make. So I'll give you one example. Uh, this is another paper that I didn't assign, but uh, it's a good paper uh, that is good to read uh, from Todd Maury's group here. Uh, but one uh, example is uh, this uh, program that's very difficult to parallelize. Why? Because it potentially has loop carry dependencies, right? If you look at this, this is a loop. You keep uh, indexing the hash table with some index, getting some value and then you write to another index, some other value, and different uh, iterations, a later iteration uh, may read from uh, an index that was written in a previous iteration, right? So that's why it's difficult to parallelize because these indices may be dynamically determined based on input data and programmer has no idea what that input data is so the programmer cannot parallelize this. But if you have some substrate like this, what you can do is you can execute each iteration in parallel, assume that they're independent uh, in different processors, 
and have enough bookkeeping such that uh, to, to be able to detect these inter iteration dependencies. So in this case, for example, this first iteration, it's called epoch here, is uh, writing to this hash array uh, at location 10. And this fourth iteration happens to have already read from that hash array at location at index 10. Right? So this should not happen, of course, right? This, epo this fourth iteration should wait for this value to be produced. But with thread level speculation, you're speculatively assuming that these are independent. So you've already executed this operation that reads from hash 10 and you executed the rest of the thread. But if you can figure out this dependency, you can figure out that this thread, speculative thread, has read a value that was late, uh, before that value was actually written earlier in the program by a previous thread, you can squash this thread. Right? That's the idea. The key question is how do you detect that dependency? And when do you detect that dependency? And how do you squash the thread? Okay. And then you can, all, you can actually, once you detect that dependency, let's assume that you've detected it. I'll tell you in the next slide how you detect it in this particular approach. Uh, basically, let's say you detect it when you try to commit this epic four, and commits, in this case, happen serially. They need to happen serially, right? This first iteration should commit, and then the next iteration should commit, and then the next iteration should commit, and then the next iteration should commit. And then what does commit mean? It makes its results visible to the entire system. When this uh, iteration tries to commit, it figures out that it cannot, it should not commit because it has read a stale value. Then this iteration can be squashed and re-executed. In this case, actually, you can re-execute only this iteration, and later iterations may have already been executed potentially. I guess this, this doesn't show that, but that's okay. Okay, so the question is how do you detect that dependency? Uh, how do you detect that a thread has read a value, a stale value? Well, we have uh, cache coherence protocols, right? We can utilize them. And most of these approaches actually utilize the cache coherence protocols. Uh, what is the, well, you need to modify the cache coherence protocol a little bit. Uh, what is the idea? Let's take a look at this example here. Uh, in this case, you have two uh, processors. One is executing iteration five. The other is executing iteration six. Uh, and this one has done a speculative load through a pointer. Uh, and in this case, the pointer P and Q happen to be the same. Uh, this instruction does a speculative. Uh, so when it does a speculative load, ba basically it loads the cache block, right, associated with that load address. And you have for each cache block two bits. One is speculatively loaded bit, and the other is speculatively modified bit. And many approaches to transactional memory have these bits. They're called read-write bits also. Have I read this block? Have I written to this block? Uh, in this case, when you do a load, speculative load, obviously this processor has speculative loaded, so that bit is set to true. But it did not modify this uh, uh, cache block, so that modified bit is set to false. Now when another processor does a store, Store is also speculative, right? Uh, well, assuming that there's another epoch, another iteration running in some other uh, core, and an older iteration is running some other core. What it does is, uh, it basically uh, writes to this cache block, and it sets the speculatively loaded and speculatively modified bits to true, but it also sends an invalidation to the younger epochs or younger iterations. Remember, this is cache coherence. If you're writing to a block, you need to get it exclusive. You need to have it as an exclusive copy in an invalidation-based protocol. In an update-based protocol, you should send the written block to all of the shares, right? Let's assume an invalidation-based protocol right now. You could make this work in an update-based protocol also. You need to change the protocol. But you need to send the invalidation to all of the shares of the block. In addition to sending an invalidation, now you also send the 
iteration or epoch count. Right. In this case, it's epoch five. And this invalidation gets recorded here. And the processor checks whether its epoch is greater than the epoch that caused the invalidation. If it's greater, then you know that this invalidation is coming from some earlier place in the code. And if you've actually speculatively loaded that cache line, then you know that you've done the wrong thing, right? You violated a dependency. So at that point, actually, you could squash this task. They, they don't do it that way in this paper. They uh, squash the task at the end uh, in this attempt commit function. But you don't have to wait until then, right? You could squash the task right away. Because you know that you've done a wrong read. <laughs> but the paper has a discussion on whether you want to speculatively squash the task or you want to wait until the end. And you can read the paper for, uh, uh, I guess, to figure out what the trade-offs are. Does that make sense? Hopefully, this is clear. Right? So you can make use of the cache coherence protocols that already exist to detect these dependencies when you speculatively execute different tasks uh, where you've formed the tasks uh, dynamically right, without programmer support. OK, so what are, uh, I'll give you some benefits of this, and then we'll take a break uh, and then continue. But this paper reported actually significant benefits uh, from mm, thread-level speculation. Uh, it, these are some of the applications, and uh, th these are the real speedups. These are the speedups in the parallel portion. And the, so the, uh, the benefits are about, uh, with four processors, you can parallelize uh, speculatively these applications and get about 46% benefit for this one, 12% benefit for compression, which actually tends to be harder to parallelize than, the, uh, than these two, at least. Uh, and 20% and 8% benefits on these two others. And this is all done speculatively without programmer support. And if you look at this, this has some analysis, uh, but adding more cores is not always good, but you've already known that, right? If you add more threads, speculatively execute more threads, sometimes you start losing performance. This is execution time on the uh, y-axis. These are different benchmarks. And for each benchmark, they show the execution time of the parallel part of the program uh, normalized to one processor, basically single-threaded execution. And for this application, as you add more processors, you get better performance. But for some other applications, you lose performance. So for example, here, the peak happens at four processors. But if you go to eight processors, you actually lose, do worse than a single-threaded version of the program. And you know the reasons for this, right? We already covered this in the first two lectures or so. It's exactly the same reason as uh, uh, in, what, what we had for accelerated critical sections, right? Your performance peaks at a point and then drops down because you have too much coherence tra traffic. In this case, you have too many invalidations going on. In fact, in this case, it's probably worse because there is no programmer support at all, right? The, uh, these blocks are all speculatively generated. They may have lots of dependencies. Right? And once you have lots of dependencies, you have a lot of invalidations that happen. And with eight threads, that's why you're probably getting worse performance than with a single thread. So this, uh, these are actually optimistic results, but you could look at them in a different way also. These are pessimistic results, right? You're using four processors to get only 8% better performance. Is that a worthwhile trade-off? And this has been the difficulty of these thread-level speculation approaches in general for, I guess, almost 20 years now. Uh, there, there, there has not been a significant speed-ups. So whereas if you look at the results that we've looked at uh, with, uh, when you actually parallelize the program, then you get much better speed-ups in general. Of course, then the programmer effort is high, but uh, the question is, do you want to put more programmer effort and get higher speed ups, or do you want to put no programmer effort and get relatively low speed ups? So that's, some, that's food for thought. That's one of the reasons thread level uh, speculation-like approaches 
uh, have not uh, taken off significantly because the performance benefits that people have seen, at least in the last two decades, have not been as compelling to put uh, the hardware support that's needed for these. Although we'll get to one, one kind of thread level speculation that already exists in processors today. I think going forward, things may be different, right? Because it's very hard, uh, it's, a, it's a lot harder to get performance right now uh, out of uh, systems. And it may be, uh, we might want to reconsider some of these approaches. And we'll see one approach, like transactional memory or speculative lock elision, which are also very similar to thread level speculation that uh, keep going into processors right now. Okay. I guess let me cover this also and then uh, we will take a break and continue with speculation. There are some other multi-threading issues. Maybe this is not the best place for the slide, but I didn't know where else to put it. <laughs> there are some other multi-threading issues that we did not cover, uh, but that are also very interesting. Uh, one is, uh, how do you select threads to co-schedule on the same processor? Now we're switching, uh, we're doing a big context switch. <laughs> it's not about speculation at all. Uh, how do you select threads to co-schedule on the same processor? And uh, one question is which threads and phases go well together? This issue actually exists in multi-core also because whenever you have resource sharing, you would like to put threads that either share data together or that do not destroy each other's performance together. And I think I've given you a reference uh, to uh, a paper that talks about this, right? Snavely and Talson. S plus 2010 on symbiotic scheduling. It's also defined the weighted speed up metric. Basically, they try to figure out uh, threads that do not destroy each other's performance, that are symbiotic with each other, and they schedule them together. Um, and this is, uh, going forward, this will be an important, uh, even more important question, I think. How do you provide performance isolation between threads or predictable performance? And people have looked at this as well. And going forward, again, this will be a, uh, an even bigger issue. Uh, because this also exists in multi-core. And as you want to consolidate more threads, more applications, more virtual machines on the same chip and same core, you really would like to provide predictable performance. And how do you manage shared resources among threads? We have looked at some of these uh, in SMT context. But there's a lot more, especially if you want to provide some performance predictability to the different threads. We looked at approaches that try to maximize performance and fairness, right? Remember the mechanisms, uh, fairness and throughput in switch on event multi-threading that we've discussed that try to balance the slowdowns of different threads that improves performance and fairness. But if you want to actually provide predictable performance, you need stronger mechanisms. So if you want to guarantee that this thread should not be slowed down by this much. That requires more mechanisms. And I'd encourage you to think about that too, because that's another area that's very open going forward. Uh, and this is true increasingly uh, in many different systems. This has been true for real-time systems for a long time. But increasingly, uh, when we consolidate many workloads on the same chip on different places, uh, data centers, you need this kind of uh, guarantees. Maybe not as bad as hard real-time systems, but, uh, mm, but close enough perhaps. <laughs> I guess in this case it depends on how much your customer pays in the data center. But uh, there could be other cases where you really want to consolidate for energy efficiency and cost purposes. Okay. Okay, I guess I'll stop here and then we'll continue uh, in five minutes. Is that good? Okay, we've been talking about speculation actually, but we'll go even more deeper into speculation right now. And here are some readings, although this is by no means an a uh, complete list. And you have two required ones, uh, one on multiscalar and the other on transactional memory. But we will also cover, well, we, we've kind of covered the uh, Colohan paper, thread level speculation paper, but we'll also cover speculative lock collision Let's see, PowerPoint has a bug here, I think. Yeah. This was missing, right? <laughs> yeah, and 
probably we won't cover the dynamic multi-threading processor unless we have time for it. But these are interesting papers to read. People have tried a lot to uh, make this happen. <laughs> and we'll try to update the reading list too. So I guess let's go to the basics. I've already given you what speculation is, right? Speculation is doing something before you know it is needed. And we have many, many examples of it. It's mainly used to enhance performance. In the single processor context, we do a lot of things before knowing that it's needed, right? We talk about branch prediction, data value prediction, prefetching. They're all speculation mechanisms. Because you uh, fetch the next instruction before knowing that you know that it's the next instruction, before knowing that it's the next instruction, right? Or you fetch some data speculatively before knowing that, which means that you fetch it before knowing that you, know, you, you need it. You may have some evidence, but you don't know for sure. In the multiprocessor context, actually a lot of things we'll cover, uh, like helper threads is a method of speculation. Transactional memory is a method of speculation. You speculate that these two transactions will execute in parallel, right? If you decide to do, do so. Uh, thread level speculation, well, this is speculative execution, right? You speculate that these threads are not dependent on each other. And if they are dependent, you won't get the benefit. And there are some other examples which we may get to. Uh, in speculative multi-threading, thread level speculation or speculative parallelization, the idea is to execute threads on safely in parallel. And more generally, threads can be from a sequential or parallel application. Right? Uh, in thread level speculation, threads are from a sequential application. You have a sequence. Well, there are no threads in the sequential application. It's sequ sequential. But you chunk the sequential application into multiple tasks or multiple threads. But you don't have to do it this way. You can have multiple threads that are already uh, executing, that are already deemed to be parallel. But you may execute them speculatively when they get to a critical section, for example, right? You may speculate that they're not going to conflict if you execute this critical section that they're both waiting for in parallel on both threads. Basically, if you allow the, both threads to enter the same critical section, nothing bad may happen, right? Because they may not conflict with each other. That's the same idea, well, similar idea. As long as you can detect the conflicts and make sure no, nothing bad happens, meaning you don't uh, write wrong results, you're perfectly fine, right? That's the idea behind transactional memory and speculative lock collision. When you get to a serializing point in the program, keep going, assuming that uh, nobody else that is at the same point will, going to conflict, uh, will be conflicting with you. So at the general point, uh, at a very high level, speculative parallelization doesn't care if the threads are, you have multiple threads or a single thread. The key is, the hardware or software somehow needs to monitor for the data dependence violations. And people have proposed mechanisms both in purely hardware, purely software, and a hardware-software cooperative way to figure out these data dependence violations. I won't talk about the software approach that much, but you can think of a lot of these approaches being done in software also. In fact, there's software transactional memory uh, that people have implemented, and uh, they're finding that it's very slow to use. Okay, so if there's a data dependence ordering, a true ordering that's violated, the offending thread is squashed and restarted. But if data dependencies are not violated, the thread commits. And if threads are from a sequential order, that sequential order needs to be preserved, just like here, right? You need to commit these threads in the sequential order they were written. But if the threads are already part of a parallel if they're already specified to be parallel, you can just commit it right away. Right. Okay. So one thing that you need to uh, ensure in all of this, these speculative parallelization methods is you need to ensure that inter-thread value communication happens correctly. And this could happen in two ways. It could happen through registers. And it could happen through memory. 
Now, if you already parallelized your program, usually it doesn't happen through registers, right? At least in current parallel programming paradigms, threads do not communicate through the registers. Maybe there, are, there, there could be, it doesn't have to, but are, are there programming paradigms that you guys have used where threads communicate through registers? A lot of people are saying no, or I don't know. <laughs> yeah, as far as I know, at least the popular program uh, paradigms, threads do not communicate through registers. They communicate through memory. Like locks are stored in memory. Right? Barriers are locations in memory. Uh, but in something like this, threads can communicate through registers and multiscalar. For example, threads communicate through registers because threads are formed uh, dynamically or uh, by, created by the compiler or they're fine-grained, another way of putting it. Uh, register communication needs hardware between processors that currently uh, doesn't exist. Right? Uh, so there are fundamental differences between register and memory communication, which we covered before, and we're gonna get back to that. The fundamental difference is in register communication, the compiler knows the dependencies between threads, right? And that's what multiscalar takes advantage of. Uh, and this register communication can be producer or consumer initiated because you know that you need to wait for something else. Uh, you, can, you can initiate this and you can orchestrate this or you can schedule it better in the sense that uh, let's say the consumer thread executes first. Then the consumer can stall because it knows that it's waiting for that register, right? Somebody else should be producing it or should be potentially producing it. Let me put it that way. Does that make sense? Because register communication can be known by the compiler, maybe conservatively, it knows that when a consumer needs a register, whether that's consumed by uh, this within the thread or whether it's supposed to be consumed by some other thread. Right? And if the consumer thread executes first, it stalls. And producer, when it executes, it forwards the data to the register. This is what happens in multiscalar, right? Multiscalar, when uh, you get to a register that is not written to yet from a previous task, you wait. And at some point, that register value will magically appear on the ring. And when it appears, you capture that value, and now you can execute the instruction, right? So hopefully, this is not alien to you since you're, you're supposed to have uh, read the multiscalar paper, but we'll get to that also. If the producer executes first, now the producer can write to the register and can continue and send the value to the consumer, and the consumer reads later. So it's very similar to full empty bits, right? You can have full, uh, a bit with each register saying register is empty or register is full. And if the register is empty, which means that somebody else should be producing it, you wait until the register becomes full. If the register is full, the consumer can just go ahead. And that's how multiscalar also operates. They don't call, uh, I don't remember if they actually called it full empty bits, but this, the, the concept is essentially full empty bits. Do they call it full empty bits? Let's see who read it, who, who read it carefully. <laughs> no? Okay. Yeah, but the, they actually they don't go into too much detail, I think, into, the, into how this hardware is. Is that correct? Yeah. But the, you need some hardware like this. And you know where the full empty bits is coming from, right? You read the paper that described the full empty bits. It's Burton Smith's paper, the HEP processor. Okay. Uh, well, memory communication is very different. Memory dependencies are not known by the compiler. Uh, at least the interesting memory dependencies are not known by the compiler. Uh, but regardless of this, true dependencies between uh, predecessor and successor threads need to be preser preserved. One approach to doing this is to have the threads perform load speculatively, uh, get the data from the closest predecessor or wh whoever has written the data, uh, and keep record that the thread has read the data somewhere. Right? This is, remember the thread level speculation paper? They were keeping whether a cache line is speculatively read, right? speculatively loaded. So you need to keep some record of that. And stores are also performed speculatively. And uh, stores need to be buffered while they're speculative, right? You cannot commit a speculative store into memory because you don't know if the thread will actually commit. 
And when, you, when, a, when a thread does a store, it checks the successors, like later threads, for pre premature reads, right? I think now I'm assuming uh, this single thread speculative partition the multi multiple threads. And this is uh, when you write to a location here, which may be executed much later than a read here, you check whether anyone has read that location that you're writing to. And if there's a successor thread that has read that location, then you squash that successor thread. And squashing means basically you uh, flush the entire thread and refetch it, okay? Uh, typically, you squash the offending thread and all of the successors. Do you have to do that? You don't have to, right? You can just squash this successor thread and it will re-execute. And successors may have executed correctly because they may not be dependent. Okay, well, I'll let you think about the trade-offs related to that. Uh, okay. So only to, uh, obviously only true de data dependence violations should cause a thread squash. Uh, and there, uh, there may be false dependencies, which we've covered in, uh, in register renaming, right? In memory, uh, you can rename these dependencies also. For a, a load, I guess these are ordering dependencies. Uh, so if you, uh, let's say this is the, predecessor thread and this is a successor thread and assume that these are to the same locations. If a predecessor thread does a store and a successor thread has already done a load to the same location, that's the true dependence, right? But this could go the other way around, right? The predecessor thread may do a load later than a successor thread does a store to the same location. So you shouldn't get the wrong value in this case, which means this is doing a store to A and this is doing a load to A this load should not see the result of the store, right? Because there is no dependence between these two threads. And neither, of course, should you, uh, should you squash this thread because it hasn't read the wrong value. So hardware can handle this, obviously, right? If you keep these stores as speculative and not visible to other threads, then you don't have a problem. Similarly, if you have store, store, if this is doing a store to A and this is doing a store to A, you don't need to squash this, right? You just need to order the stores such that they appear in the order they would have appeared as a single thread, okay? So only this one really needs to cause a squash. And name dependencies can be resolved using ver versioning. Uh, this can be done in many ways. Uh, there is one way here, but this can be done uh, using store buffers where the stores do not get visible. But what if you have a cache and you're keeping the uh, locations in the cache? Let's say you're, these th four threads are sharing a cache and this is doing a store. Uh, this is, let's do this. This is doing a store to A and this is the block A. And this is doing a load to A. Well, you shouldn't get a cache hit. You shouldn't get a cache hit, right, in this case. So how can you fix this problem? You can tag each cache entry with the uh, epic number. In this case, it could be ep epic four. And if this epic is reading location A, this is epic one, you compare the epic number and if, you're, if the epic number that's reading is smaller than the epic number that's already in the cache, then you shouldn't get that value. Of course, this causes some problems since you're at the cache block granularity, right? Now you get cache misses. And you may have many versions of A <laughs> in the cache. But this is, one, uh, this is one specific implementation where you're actually exposing the speculative stores into the cache. And this paper talks about in detail how to design a speculative version in cache. It's a complicated design. You need to change the coherence protocol. Uh, but I'll let you think about it. I'll just give you the paper. 
So that's one way of handling it. Another way of handling it is, of course, not exposing these stores to the cache even. You have a store buffer uh, that basically keeps the speculative stores here. Right? And you expose those stores into the cache only after they're committed. So get your cache doesn't have speculative stores. And that's a trade-off also. Okay, well, I guess this is a trade-off, right? You could have separate buffers. Where do you keep the speculative memory state, speculative stores? You can have separate buffers, for example, store queue, either shared or private, uh, or as we will see, address resolution buffer in multi-scalar processors. This was not in the paper you read, uh, but uh, they use an address resolution buffer, which is actually an interesting idea, I think, at the time, uh, to do the sp uh, store load forwarding. Or you could put the speculative stores in your L1 cache, right? Speculative stored blocks need to be marked as speculative, uh, which means that they're not visible to other threads. Uh, and, of course, now you need to make them non-speculative when the thread commits. Right? When a thread commits, you need to somehow figure out which of these stores, speculatively stored blocks, were actually from this thread and make them non-speculative. And that may not be that easy when you have a cache like this. Right? because you need to somehow keep track of what are the stores that this particular thread has done before committing that thread. It may be easier if you have a store buffer for that particular thread. So there are complexities associated with it. And you also need to invalidate them when the thread is squashed, right? And that adds another complexity, which means that you somehow need to keep track of what are the things that you've added into the store buffer. So you need to have pointers, perhaps, to those cache blocks that you've added. Another issue that I didn't, maybe I do, I don't, that I don't have here is, uh, what if you run out of cache space, right? You want to do another store, and you're out of cache space. So you stall. Well, what, what does it mean to be out of cache space? Basically, the, all of the blocks in the cache set are all speculative stores that you have not verified yet. You could stall. That could be one option. Uh, or you could stop the, th uh, uh, I guess squashing the thread doesn't make sense. You, stalling probably is a good idea in that case. But you need to determine that case also. Okay. Let's see, we have some time. So we'll start with multi-scalar and continue later on. Uh, so multi-scalar, as I said, uh, is one of the most influential papers in this area. Uh, actually, this is not the first paper that I assigned to you. There's an earlier paper, ISCA 1992, which is essentially the same thing, but it's not developed as well. Uh, they called it the expandable split window paradigm for exploiting fine-grained parallelism. I guess the name they developed was not <laughs> as good as the <laughs> name, <laughs> name they assigned uh, three years later, right? Multiscalar sounds much greater than this expandable split window paradigm for exploiting fine grained parallelism. <laughs> okay, so uh, the idea is very similar to everything we've discussed. Uh, exploit implicit thread level parallelism within a serial program, except it's a hardware software cooperative approach. You, you have the compiler dividing the program into tasks, and these tasks are scheduled on independent processing resources. Hardware handles register dependencies between tasks, but compiler specifies which registers need to be communicated. Hardware has the full empty bits that we discussed uh, and communicates the registers that the compiler tells it to communicate to other threads. And we'll see how that communication happens. I, I keep, I'll keep calling these tasks as, and threads, uh, but when I, when I say threads, it's a task in multi-scalar context. They, they call it tasks, but it's very similar. Uh, and there's memory speculation for memory dependencies. So hardware detects and resolves misspeculations. Uh, and we'll see how it does it. Uh, so what they, when they started out, they wanted to build a large instruction window, actually. And this was the, this is one way of building a large instruction window, right? You have a, you basically fetch from a sequential instruction stream and uh, execute operations in parallel. How do you find the parallelism? Basically, with superscalar execution and out of order execution, right? You already know those very, very well. The problem is it doesn't scale. People have figured this out a long time ago. It doesn't scale because one of the problems, at least uh, the one that, uh, they showed here, 
This is from the earlier ISCA 1992 paper. Uh, is a multi-ported register file. If you want to have, I guess, a thousand, maybe a thousand is too much, let's say 16 instructions in parallel, you need to have 32 ports in your register file right? for e reading two operands per instruction. Uh, whereas if you had, if you could chop up these windows, this instruction stream into smaller windows like this and execute tasks in parallel, and these tasks have their own register file that where registers are occasionally communicated between the tasks, you can have a much more scalable processor, right? Now you have a distributed register file and you don't need to have 16 instructions per cycle in each of these tasks executed. You can have four instructions per cycle, right? To maintain the same uh, execution unit bandwidth. And that reduces the ports in the register file. So this is one, mod one way of looking at it. You can have a much more scalable instruction window with multi-scaler by executing these tasks in parallel. Okay? I guess another way of looking at it is uh, you have, instead of having a single centralized window, you have multiple distributed windows with multiple program counters. But you maintain uh, the serial execution uh, illusion for the programmer. Even though these tasks execute in parallel, uh, they're, they're, uh, they commit serially. So I guess what is a task? Uh, it could essentially be any subgraph of the control flow graph. It could be a basic block, it could be multiple basic blocks, it could be a loop body, it could be a function. It could be any arbitrary sequence of instructions, right? at least in this uh, paradigm. Uh, but of course, what is a good task is another question. <laughs> and uh, that, that is uh, part of the problem uh, with uh, part of the issue that these uh, machines need to tackle. How do you select the tasks, especially at compile time? Uh, in multi scale tasks are selected by compiler and conveyed to the hardware and predicted and scheduled by the processor. So one issue you, you have here is what is the next task you should send to the next processor, right? That requires some prediction because you may have a branch that goes this way or this way and your next task depends on that branch. If that branch is hard to predict, now, you may always be squashing the next task after you execute the previous task. So that's one consideration in creating a task. How do you, mm, how do you cut the control flow graph such that these mispredictions are minimized? Right. One place, uh, for, for example, loop iterations, loops uh, uh, that iterate many times, you can have each iteration as a task in that case, it's very likely that your task will not be squashed, right? Mm. Or you could put the hard to predict branches within a task, right? Because if you have a misprediction within a task, that should not affect the processing in other tasks, right? You could handle that misprediction internally within the task. In fact, that's, you read the paper, so you know that that's, uh, they say this is one of the benefits of this approach. With a large instruction window, you cannot do that easily, at least. Right? When, a, when you get a mispredicted branch, you just flush the rest of the pipeline. Whereas in this case, if you have a branch misprediction within the task, you, you don't need to flush the remaining task, tasks. Only at a branch, only at a task misprediction, if you will, you should flush the remaining tasks. So you can hide the branch misprediction penalty by embedding hard to predict branches within tasks and cutting the control flow graph when forming the tasks at places where control flow is predictable. Does that make sense? Then you can exploit the substrate much better also. Okay, tasks may obviously have data and control dependencies between them, and these need to be handled. Uh, and, okay, this is uh, what a multi-scalar processor looks like. Basically, you have a task sequencer, which basically predicts what is the next task. And it distributes the task in a round-robin fashion. Uh, you always have a head processor, which executes the oldest task. And you always have a tail processor, which executes the youngest task. And there's always an ordering between the tasks. Um, 
and each of the processors have their I caches. This, this task sequencer basically supplies the program counter of the task. Uh, and each of them have their register files. And uh, note that these register files are interconnected so that tasks can communicate the values with each other. And there's an interconnection network and uh, this is the memory subsystem. I guess I'll stop here because there's a lot more material to cover than uh, what we have, uh, than the time we have. But I'll leave you with thinking, what is the, just by looking at this picture, what is the bad thing about this design? Maybe you can think about it a little bit. I think you can figure it out just by looking at this picture. Maybe you can blur it out now or you can think about it <laughs> and come back, we can talk about it on Friday. So we'll go into more detail uh, about multi-scalar processors. No, nobody wants to venture a guess. This has been one of the big concerns actually in industry in implementing something like this. It should be somewhat apparent in this picture, but. <laughs> no, nothing? What looks harder to, hardest to implement here, you think? You mean this interconnection? <laughs> Somebody said register files and they're right. What, about, what in particular about the register file? This ring network, right? It's such a tight part of the processor and you have a ring connecting the register file. And that's, uh, that is difficult to implement at high frequency. I'm not saying it's impossible to implement, but that's, that's been one of the big concerns in industry. If you want to have this fine grain register communication, uh, you need to have this ring. And which is a very tight network at a very high frequency, right? And it does disturb, even though it, it, if you look at it, it does reduce your ports, but there are other ways of reducing your ports also, right? Without building a ring. Like you can cluster your processor and reduce your ports that way, and we've discussed that. You still need to provide mechanisms to communicate data values across clusters, but that doesn't have to be a ring. Here you need to have this ring and you need to communicate values across and you need to schedule. So you're scheduling operands coming from here into the register file and you're scheduling operands coming from here into the register file. Where does the scheduler sit? That does complicate the design, right? Because you want to build an out of order processor here there is a scheduler and you want to build, well, you want to build this ring and that is also trying to schedule to the ports. You either dedicate a port, which increases your port count when it's not utilized, or you have a global scheduler that uh, looks at all of the ports of the register file. Right. Okay, anyway, maybe you'll think about other ways of designing this, but uh, We'll get to multiscalar more in the next lecture.